Okay, the recording started, uh, the meeting started, and I'm just going to go look at the minutes. Okay, so uh, uh, anyone here like to do an introduction? I think we're all, um, we all know each other already. Um, if not, there are no announcements. And the first item on the agenda is Chris who wants to show us uh, some PyScript related worksheets. Um, so Chris, when you're ready, unmute, um, share your screen and the floor is yours, matey. Okay, I'm unmuted. Of course, I'm, I need one minute. Okay. One second. If only I had or my one. tuba with me right here, I could play some elevator music, the lowest elevator yeah. music you'd ever hear, but you know. You have some updates on things that you... Updates on... You said like, there's a topic about AI. I'm very interested in that. Yeah, okay. Well, let's do the AI topic first while you're getting yourself sorted out then, because uh, I just want to foster maybe five or ten minutes worth of discussion. Andrea... And I were talking about this earlier today when we were having our, you know, Anaconda one-to-one. -one. Um, but AI is a sort of a hot topic and it would be nice to perhaps curate um, some examples of uh, machine learning, as in the modern sense of machine learning and AI, um, uh, that are on PyScript. Uh, so uh, this is just a kind of call for action on Put your thinking hats on, have a look at some examples. Uh, Andrea, I know you did some work a few months ago on this, just as a goofy sort of example, and you're going to resurrect it zombie-like, a zombie AI on uh, on Thursday for the uh, show and tell. Um, and I think it's an LLM you've got working uh, on PyScript, I believe. Uh, but I'm just trying to plant some ideas um, uh, for that. I'm writing a blog post about how neural networks work. Um, 20 years ago, I wrote a dissertation about neural networks for my master's degree, and it turns out that not a lot has changed in terms of the fundamental processes going on in neural networks. Uh, clearly, a lot more compute power is happening, and the modeling that the neural networks are actually being trained on is a lot more sophisticated. So uh, that's rather a lot of fun, but I want to use PyScript in that. So as I'm unfolding from the ground up how neural networks work and LLMs work, um, we've got examples in MicroPython, believe it or not, um, running on the on the blog post um so thoughts just planting a seed there uh if you've got a reaction to that come along to thursday's demo um and show us something um give us a demo uh and i've been waffling now for perhaps about three minutes and i'm, I'm kind of hoping that chris is going to give me a signal to say yeah he's good good okay you've read what i was doing okay so i'm waffling over um now we've done that agenda item uh chris the floor is yours if you want to share your screen i can put it up so that uh, the recording sees it properly. Fantastic. Thank you. Hi. So uh, a quick feedback on the AI idea. Uh, like, I think a lot of the uh, uh, machine learning model training that happens requires performance. Mm. So doing anything like that in the browser is a no-go, I would think. Uh, Absolutely. For that reason, uh, just the memory requirements in the browser anyway. Yeah. Uh, research. Yeah. So I can see us using AI and leveraging it and having a compelling front end to the information that the AI generates. Like I can imagine rewriting chat GPT in PyScript, like the UI, like from the browser. Yeah. Coming up with a much, much more interesting one, right? So the, tra is, so the training is very computationally intensive and it's why it takes like yeah. two months to train yeah. chat GPT for or whatever it is, you know, with a corpus of terabytes. Um, but yeah. the, there is a lot of work going on in small open source LLMs, um, not so much the training uh, in my mind, but also um, the fact that once you've got the weights and things sort of figured out, uh, it's, um, you know, less computationally intensive, as it were. We can run the LLM locally. But anyway, uh, let, let's park that and we can perhaps chat about it uh, on, on Thursday when people have had more, more chance to look yeah. into it, which is something I want to do. But I, I love this. Pie sheets, pie sheets is in alpha mode. Use at your own risk. I kind of want a klaxon sound to be going off here as well. But anyway, Chris, over to you. 
that's in the same thing for BiScript. BiScript yes. is an alpha one. And, oh, it's no longer an alpha, right? Like, like what's the official status? Hang on, I'm curious about that. Anyway, the, the, but, the, the official oh, well. status is that we're using Calva, so. Uh... <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going to give a demo of PySheets. PySheets is an, uh, an application that is written using PyScript. So it's written entirely in Python. It runs in the browser because of the stack of PyScript allowing you to run MicroPython and Pyodite uh, on top of WebAssembly into index.html. So basically, you can replace whatever you write with JavaScript now with Python. So that's a very powerful way of yeah, using the, the capabilities that you have and the skills that you have in Python coding. But now we'll point them to write web applications. So that's the innovative part of PyScript, I believe, I think. Um, so what I will show you is uh, an application. If you're already looking at it, it's already running. It's showing you some text and a couple buttons and text fields. So this is implemented in Python already. This is what you're looking at. Uh, and it's running currently on MicroPython. So I will refresh the page so you can get a feeling for the performance because I'm, I'm very performance oriented. I want to make things fast and I wanted to make this page come up as quickly as possible. So I'll refresh and you can see it. Yeah, it comes up almost before I release the mouse button. It's, it's that fast. So what happens in this cycle is that the page gets reloaded, index.html. Um, inside of that, there's a worker. So I can shoot, shoot a few page here. So the page still works, has um, the font a little bit bigger. First we import by script, and then uh, inside I have a worker that says, I'm running MicroPython, and this is the MicroPython config, and it chooses a specific interpreter that's not relevant to most people, but in my case, I wanted to freeze to a particular one. And then I have some files that I want to have copied into the virtual file system that PyScript manages for me so that my main can import these, these particular modules. So this is just a way of importing modules into MicroPython, which is a little bit more complex than in PyLite. There, you don't need all these things. You can just import modules from PyPy, the PyPI. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm supporting both. You, know, you will see that later in the, in the demo as well. So this is... Um, the thing running that you just saw the source so it's it, it's an index html and it starts up the micropython runtime on top of webassembly it loads the main.py which imports all kinds of other modules and then those become alive and they start intra in, uh, operating interoperating with the dom and they start creating things like buttons and text so this is iteratively created by Python code that gets bootstrapped by running PyScript. So again, I'll, I'll do a refresh a couple of times so you get really the appreciation for the performance here. This is really important to get this really up, up and running fast. So I'll uh, log in, I'll use my known identity. I've got two, so I can play with two, two kinds of personalities. And the first thing that PySheet will show you are the five sheets that I have access to with this particular um, identity that I logged in with. So I'm chrislaffer at gmail.com. I can also log out, sign out, and then become something else. Um, I can open one of these sheets. Um, so you can see I have chess, I have market data, earthquakes, bike store, and usage dashboard. So those are the five different things that I'm interested in, and they show different capabilities of this application, this collection of Python modules that will create a, a spreadsheet. So, so the first one is by on bike store, so I'll click on that. Uh, you see it starts up pretty fast. If I refresh, it starts up again, and you can see it's like, yeah, like within a second. This is what we expect from tools like Google Sheets which is sort of an inspiration for this environment. But it's more like a Jupyter Notebook, which was my real driving motivation, is to have a different way of thinking about how you write an algorithm or how you research a data analytics problem 
you know, some information, uh, you want to change it, you modify it, you want to look at it and then do something else. And normally in Jupyter Notebooks, that's a linear flow. And that is really suitable for a lot of applications. Like people have written millions of Python notebooks that are on GitHub, for instance. Uh, but I'm, I'm always thinking more of the problem in a in a graphical way, in a graph. Literally, there's a dependency graph for me. So what I wanted to experiment here is to do something, the same thing you can do in IPython notebooks, where you have a kernel that runs the code, and then you basically represent that into the browser. But I want to do that in a spreadsheet UI. So I try to merge the two here together. So what we have in this particular example is just a basic one. We have some data that lives in the sheet. So these numbers are actually stored in the document when it gets saved to the server. So I'm going to make a change here. Uh, this data behind the scenes, so there's, a, there's a callback that re reacts to the changes in the spreadsheet, and it makes a copy that sends the edits back to the server. So if I refresh, which is 250, I didn't save anything. This is like Google Docs. Um, you do refresh and it's still 250 because it reloaded the document from the Firestore database that runs on Google Cloud and it runs, it loads it here locally and renders the spreadsheet. So if you have a second person, second identity, and you look at the same document, you would see the changes in real time because I also sent the changes to everybody's looking at the document right now. That's behind the scenes. Um, so the data gets transformed into what's called a Pandas data frame. And um, you can see the code for that is, it says like, take whatever is in A1 through C6 and turn it into a sheet or read that from the sheet, turn it into a data frame and group it by category and then aggregate by sum. So if I hover over this, you can actually see what the dependency graph is. So it's uh, like A1, which is this top corner to C6, which is the bottom corner. Uh, so if I change this number, like I would say like C5, I would emit one row. Then you can see the data frame selects a different section of the document. So now you only get row five. So I'll change this back to the row six. And then it takes the whole selection again. So the data frame has a preview. So in the preview here, um, you can see this is like a standard pandas representation of a dev pandas data frame. Uh, but I can move it around. So I can, if I want to leave it here, that's fine. And if I refresh the document, it will actually appear there again. Uh, so. You can also have dependencies to more complex things. So this is just the numbers here in this sheet, but I can also say like, I have uh, something that depends on E1, that's right here, like, and I want to plot it as a horizontal bar. So I say like E1.plot bar H. So this is standard pandas matplotlib way of rendering. And what it produces is something that works really well in Jupyter Notebooks, which is um, a representation of this in HTML. So there's various ways in, you can write extensions for Jupyter Notebook to render things in the notebook. And I'm following that same standardization or, or uh, way of rendering things. So this is bar H. If you change this into a regular bar, it will be vertical, I think. Yep, so now it's a vertical one. And this is a regular plot. So if I go here, you can see this just E1 plot. So this how it works. If I change the numbers, then you will see the preview updates with it. Uh, let me resize this one here. So if I change these numbers, uh, it, it listens to the arrow keys. So the numbers update in the preview, but they also change in the chart uh, pretty, pretty quickly, which was kind of a puzzle to get this working because all of this code runs in a worker. So we have MicroPython running the UI so it renders this UI. And at the same time, when it has work that it cannot run on MicroPython, because MicroPython has, by design, all kinds of limitations. It wants to be as tiny as possible. So it cannot run things like Pandas, because you need more of the standard library to run Python, uh, to run 
And so we run that on Pyodite, and that has a separate worker. So that's behind the scenes. There's a web worker running that runs Pyodite. So I got two Python VMs running. And that's the one that's doing the conversion of this data into a data frame and then into these charts. So whenever I make a change here, it tries to run it locally. If it can, then it runs it locally. But if it cannot, then it asks the worker, can you run this script for me and produce the output and then let me know when it changes and then it gets written back to the sheet. That's how it works. So you have two different VMs running here. Um, you can also call service calls. So I can uh, go to, for instance, earthquakes. So this one is calling this particular earthquake URL. Um, and what it returns is a CSV document, which you can then easily read into Pandas. So I'll make the pun a little bigger here. So you can read the CSV, which is coming out of this URL, which is here, Earthquake USA. So that's the, the last four and a half days of earthquakes. What you get back is CSV. You can load that in a pandas document. And here's the preview. So this is the output of that script here. So this is the preview. So you see there's currently nine earthquakes that are worth mentioning. And then I take that data frame and I say, uh, run this script. So this is a different one. It imports volume. It takes a volume map. And then it basically looks over the data uh, from, what is this one, A2. So A2, it picks up the latitude, longitude, and magnitude and place of these things. And then it basically attaches a marker into the map, and then it finally returns the map. And this is where the conversion happens again. So a map is, volume maps are Jupyter friendly. So you can convert them to HTML very easily. And that renders then in the document here. So I'll make it a little bit bigger, the document itself. Um, I don't know how that, what happens with the presentation. If I make the browser bit. So now you can see if I click on this, then um, you can see it, it shows the magnitude, whatever. And that's done here. So that's uh, so this entire UI is now yeah, generated in Python and it uses external data, so not just static data from the sheet, but also external data. And you can imagine that you can combine these things, of course. Um, haven't, still don't have a demo of that, but that's it. And then uh, I tried to call an external service from uh, a market data because I wanted to build a financial application. So this is going to, uh, uh, imports Polygon and then does a stocks client. And I did sign up with this idea, but, and it says like you can get free quotes, but apparently not really. So <laughs> this is not working yet. Uh, I'll, I'll go back to the drawing board and try something else. And then the most coolest one, I think, uh, coolest demo is chess. So what is chess? So what chess tries to do is first you sort of blink, it tries to run in MicroPython. And it tries to load the dependencies that I say. So I say, like, I want, when I run this application, it needs to import this module, yes. So this comes from PyPI. And like I said before, we can't really run all these things on MicroPython. So it detects that and then re-renders the page with the name of that module as a dependency. And now the server knows to return the uh, index.html. Uh, a second time, but now it runs in PyLite. So if I do a few source here, um, we can actually see that uh, my stream is still running. You've passed the preview. No, okay, you can see it. Um, so now you can see that it's not running MyPy, my, and MicroPython, but it's running PyLite. Uh, so the script Py is Py. Uh, still looks the same, but it, it has different settings, so it doesn't say the interpreter or whatever. So it's just a switch in the um, in the server to know which Pyodite or MicroPython instance you want to run. Now, the cool thing is that uh, this is just a spreadsheet. But because we're running, like the whole spreadsheet is written in Python, um, and our script runs in Python, and if we can run it locally, because this is running Pyodite, 
uh, we can run in our own context. Like the code can run not just in the sandbox, it can also interact with the hosting application, which is the spreadsheet. And that's what's happening here. So in the board here, this board, um, we actually go in the bottom, it says in it board. And what it does, it uses chess dot, dot pi. So it imports that because we uh, loaded that into pi that using pi script. And then I can say, uh, iterate over these elements, then use this chess SVG package to create a piece, and then basically draw this chess board. So this is drawn using this code here uh, in Python. Um, it uses a little bit of LTK uh, that is used to generate pi sheets with. But you could have done this just using PyDOM instructions, like you don't really need to use LTK for that, but it makes it a little bit easier. Um, so you can set CSS, attributes, uh, event handlers. Uh, you can tell it to notify everybody that something has changed. And then the game part, uh, it says it depends on uh, I1. So this is the order that I detect here. So it says like once the board is ready, then I can activate the game. And the game uh, basically registers event handlers on the squares that the board has added. So I say, when you click on things, then I select that particular element. So if I click on this one, it selects it. And the selection says, like, try and find it. And then if I already have a selection, then it's a move. But otherwise, you just make it yellow. And the fun thing that happens, if I click another time, it actually is a move, right? So it moved. And now, uh, PyScript is playing a game with me. So it, it plays the black player. So you see the reaction was D5, and I click here, and I click that one, and I wait for the answer. And now I start playing a chess game with PyScript here. But it's really a spreadsheet, and the code for it is this board, which is 40 lines, and then the game itself is 60 lines, and it has the engine in it. So the, this is the engine. <clears throat> uh, so it says, like, if you want to make a move, we just try one random one, and then we determine the score of the board, and we, we look one one deeper. So what, what I know now is that this game is really into uh, hitting things. So if I put this one there, it will hit it. I know this. It will do it. Go. Do it. Yes, it did it. <laughs> and that's because the logic is really into like getting pieces as quickly as possible. So, yeah, kill all the pieces. Anyway, that's um, that's the demo of uh, different things you could do with PyScript uh, that look like Jupyter notebooks because you can um, not just write your application and render, but you can actually edit the code while it's inside this application and then partially re-render it. And that's what this spreadsheet is allowing you to do. But you can also interact with the hosting application uh, from your little scripts. Um, and so you can like play things like chess, but that's just a rather arbitrary application. The idea is to make this really easy environment for writing low code applications, so um, data-driven, Python-enabled low code applications. Um, this is so that's it. Any questions? Yeah, this is great, Chris. That was, yeah, bravo. Um, honestly, uh, uh, smiling inside. I notice Andrea has uh, also. Uh, we have half an hour left, so just with time, you know, just uh, uh, let's try being quick about the questions and things. So, Andrea, floor is yours, matey. Right. So, awesome. <laughs> First of all, uh, it's the best showcase of running MicroPython on the main and something more more complex on the on the on the worker side uh, by Pyodide. I'm super happy this works actually at the end of the day and this look all look like um, real world examples so it, it's awesome. One thing it's a rather a curiosity than a question I've seen you you using already the experimental create proxy auto. And about that, I would like to 
learn from you once you enable the a flank and i know you had to change probably some code behind the scene if it was a better experience worse experience if performance were good already or uh, or good enough and uh, or if you have any feedback about that experimental flag for us yeah definitely uh, so the way that i write my applications is i abstract out the DOM operations using jQuery. So LTK is just a really thin layer around jQuery. Um, so I try to not reinvent how you do DOM operations and use an existing JavaScript library for that. So that's also used for setting up event listeners, um, things that happen in the DOM, clicks, but also mouse movements or uh, DOM selection operation, whatever. Um, so it comes from the depths of the browser. It comes to JavaScript, goes to jQuery, and then it triggers one of my uh, proxies, the, the <clears throat> Python callbacks that uh, need to be wrapped in create proxy on Pyodite because I need to tell the Pyodite runtime that when you cross the Python space to the JavaScript space, uh, you have to keep this thing around because I'm going to listen to this event many, many, many times. So I have to call create proxy on PyDite. Like on MicroPython, when it runs in the UI, it doesn't have to do this. So my code runs both in MicroPython and in PyDite, which makes it a little bit complex because now I have to do if statements all the time. So I, I, I have a layer in LTK that will um, make LTK proxy, which will make create proxy a no-op on MicroPython, for instance. Um, but I, I understand the problem. I've, I've worked on this before in the past. In uh, at Bank of America, we had a similar environment where you could call into Java. So we had the two VMs running at the same time. You could create objects in Python, send them to Java, and Java would do something to them and then send them back. Uh, you could even subclass. We could define a class in Java and subclass it in Python and and so on. So I the, the transition between these runtimes is always hard. Like how do you avoid memory leaks between these two environments is so you need some some memory management and remembering when you pass things around from one universe to the other that you can keep track on it. And that's uh that's the hard thing. Um it doesn't really bother me that much uh, right now. Um I know Andrea and you and I have chatted in uh, in Discord this week on like we, I, I was suspicious that I might have like some leak somewhere in some space in either Pyodite or uh, somewhere else, and you suggested trying out the experimental wrapping. I have variable results with that. So currently, what you're seeing here the demos they still have explicit create proxy calls. Because I couldn't get rid of all the all the all the implications, so I still have missing, uh, yeah, uh, borrowed functions that that went away, something like that. So, so the the functions I've seen as listeners were all lambdas, and the lambdas were not wrapped to create proxy. I I believe I've seen the MicroPython side of the, the equation not the pilot side of the equation or the library behind. That That's why I was asking, because that, that flag was allowed or enabled? Yeah, I think it, it's more effective if you and I take this offline and, and okay. we'll go through the code and you can okay. even look at it. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, uh, th this is this is great. Oh, yeah. Work, Chris. Like, this, this is the coolest thing ever. I haven't shown this yet. Uh, let, let me let me go, go back. Oh, go on, work. Chris. Come on, yeah. come on. Uh, so back to Pi Sheets. Can't believe go you got it. Um, so let's just open one of them, right? So mm -hmm. I've written uh, this in Python, and if you look at the few source uh, page source, um, so it gets all of this, and then it imports main.py, mm -hmm. and then it downloads my Python code and runs it in the browser. But the problem now is that anybody. Um, like if you go to the dev console, for instance, here, and you go to the network tab, all these files come by here, and anybody can look at them and then copy all my code, right? 
they can copy my entire application. And I got a bit nervous about that. So what I wrote is a minimizer for Python. Uh, so if you go to this code now, you say if you page source uh, or inspect here in network and I'll real run, I should see main.py come by. So I'll, I'll look for main. So it says main.py here. And here you can see the actual source and it imports PySheets. So if I say PySheets, it actually gets PySheets.py as well. And, and here's the source. I'll quickly close it, close it, close it, so nobody saw it. Um, but if you go to the production version, uh, it's actually on PySheets. Um, so this is hosted on App Engine. So this is a different distribution of the same application. And now I go to the back screen and I go here. So this is what everybody sees. Um, and you go to base source. It also says main.py. But now if you go to main.py, you see this. So this is like gobbledy gobble, gobbledy gobble, gobble. So there's all these interesting things and it imports main one. So what is main one? Uh, let's see. Main one. So this is more and oh no, this is actually huh. uh, maybe it's static uh, main one. Uh, main min one, sorry. Main main one. Um, so this is what the code looks like right now. And it's basically a Python program that uses AST to load all the modules and then renames everything. So and also compress it. And the whole size of PySheet right now, so to render all of this and then reset up the worker and run the worker and do everything is about 500 lines of Python. Yeah. Thank you. That's really cool. Uh, yeah. So that's, I think, uh, the cool parts as well. So if people are uh, worried about shipping their application and giving access to all their intellectual property, um, it's not that hard to make it more difficult for others to bootstrap so, your ideas, right? So, um, so interesting aside here, Chris, um, when I was working mm -hmm. on the BBC Microbit uh, project, uh, space is of a premium uh, there. You know, there's only, I can't yes. remember, something like 16K is all you've got, as it were. Um, and there's this tool called Black that uh, that was floating around. And I remember talking to the author of Black back then because it works in the same way. There's an abstract syntax tree. And I was like, so, Lukash, I know it neatens it up and everything, but couldn't we just shorten all the names and get rid of all the white space and squish it? And uh, very wisely, Lucas sort of tutted loudly in my direction and said, now you're an idiot, Nicholas. We shouldn't do that. But... I'm glad to see that with the web and minimization and things, it's a similar sort of situation as working with an embedded uh, device. Um, I mean, for you, it, it's there's a bit more obfuscation, but I guess as well with the minim with with that, you want to kind of squash everything so everything the payloads are delivered as quickly as possible down the network. Um, I'd love to be able to uh, sort of sit. Yeah. I, I'm I'm assuming yeah. this is open source, the the kind of obfuscator that you've got or something like that. Um, because this would be a, a wonderful addition to the MicroPython community for a start, because all of a sudden, um, you know, you can start to get scripts into places where scripts perhaps shouldn't <laughs> uh, fit, if you well, see what I mean. Yeah, today it's very special focused on my own built yeah. system, so I have to extract it out and make it reusable. Yeah, I just um, wanted to call out though that that's it's it's really great work. Say, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned size, because... Uh, over time, and it actually happened yesterday, is um, my application is getting too big for MicroPython. Mm. So I've been adding more and more features. And even though it's only 600 lines of Python, right, it doesn't sound, sound that much, uh, it's more than fits in one module that MicroPython can compile. And then the compiler runs out of memory. Um, so this is when when I went to main.py, I had to wait. I had to go to main min one. There's also a min zero. So I'm already chunking up uh, my application into two parts so that MicroPython can actually compile it. So uh, these are the things you have to worry about when you write for embedded devices. In this case, MicroPython is an embedded Python VM. I, I treat it that way. So yeah. 
Yeah, uh, I, we I worked on this before at uh, at IBM. I was part of the job virtual machine team where we built embedded device applications in Java. And our VM plus libraries plus application was around one megabyte. So the whole thing was bundled up uh, in flash memory. So you didn't have to copy and, and compile the class files yeah. into memory, whatever, right? So these are all things you have to worry about when you're building smaller applications. But the nice thing about PyScript is that we abstract this all out. Yeah. Um, so that that's what I really like about it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's... That, that, um, yeah. yeah like okay, we'll be here all we afternoon uh, if we just we keep to have <laughs> performance, right? Uh, for embedded devices, yeah. you uh, when you want to write your code, you want to have a class, a, a, an abstract class, and then you want to have a concrete implementation, which is a subclass of that. And you have all these functions. They have a, another subclass of this. This is a great tool for us to deal with the complexity of our logic and and write write understandable code. Yeah. But when you run it on an embedded device, this you don't want to have this, right? Totally. You want to have one yeah. class. So uh, what we did in this um, compressor at the time for 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 these embedded devices is you take these three classes, you morph them, and you, you make one. Squash and them then, together. Uh, you inline as much functions as you yeah. can. Uh, you find functions that are never called. You remove them. Uh, you shorten names and and all these things just to make it smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, so those kinds of things I haven't looked at yet, but I think that's not that much of a problem yeah. at the moment. Just saw how fast this thing comes up yeah. uh, within yeah. a second, yeah. so oh. the whole stack. So this is not really the problem yet. Yeah. Okay, so um, Chris, this is exceptional work. It really is. I'm grinning like a Cheshire cat inside, but I'm also sensitive to the time and the fact that Fabio and I have a meeting in 20 minutes and Fabio has uh, one more item uh, that he wants to sort of show and discuss. I'll mute. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, but bravo, that was uh, that was really good fun. And I think, you know, come along to the show and tell on Thursday. Um, perhaps don't show us the things that you've just shown us, but, you know, maybe whatever else that you've managed to do, let's just uh, have some fun. Um, okay, Fabio, matey, the floor is yours. Um, real quick, two things, actually. One, Chris, um, that reminds me also, we never really moved forward the conversation around um, LTK to move to the PyScript board. Still up to it, just been busy. So apologies for this, but uh, if you're fine, I'll reach out on Discord and we can coordinate. Yeah, yeah. Same here. I, it was in the back of my mind, and like, yeah, other yeah. distraction. <laughs> exactly. Um, cool. The other thing is, uh, um, Andrea has two topics as well. So uh, I think this is quick, uh, but I want to make sure that uh, his his topics are actually before mine. Uh, but I think it will take probably more time. Um, mine is not meant to be a discussion at all. It's just uh, I want to raise awareness slash topic. Uh, Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm changing the. So we we, we uh, have fifth the topics here. All right. Uh, my topic is really uh, started to work on the PyWeb dot elements, actually dot UI dot elements, which is basically additional module to complement PyDOM uh, with creating elements and mapping elements capabilities um, so that we can uh, easy into creating UIs. Um, it's meant to be like really a shim and thin layer between Python and JavaScript so that we can create interfaces in Python, etc. feeling natural. Uh, so far, uh, I think I mapped all, all the elements that are worth actually mapping, maybe even more than uh, I should. Um, but I think, and I've been adding things, well, declaring the classes and then adding properties dynamically um, to make it look smaller and save space, etc. Now, my main question topic that we can discuss on Discord or um, GitHub is, I think it probably 
belongs to the standard library, PyWeb, etc. But I think we've been kind of leaving that aside. And so I wanted to put a seed on everyone's uh, brain asking, do you think PyWeb as a name as an and, and as a package makes sense? Should we change names? Should, should we make more clear? And if you think it's worth the putting it in the standard library or loading it uh, as a conditional file or something like this. We also have, and the last thing, and I'll quit, uh, stop is, we have a ton of extra things that we can map uh, and probably just shoving everything in the standard library is not a good idea because we will increase the size, the size, right? So, but we don't have a good mechanism right now, uh, official to do those this dynamic loading. So I just want to open the discussion and put it, the seed there. Okay, Fabio, thank you for that. Um, uh, I, I, for the sake of time, um, I'm, I'm going to move on quickly. But just so that you know, um, I was actually in Texas last week uh, and I saw Fabio face to face. Uh, he's not some sort of mythical Max Headroom type being. Um, he does exist. Uh, and, and I have hair in, in real life. He I has hair, hair in real life, the... yeah. He's, you know, you know that Fabio from the 90s, that Italian model? It's him. It's really him. Uh, so, uh, uh, but what we talked about was, uh, this is an important discussion, because, because of the web, because of getting assets from a server to a browser, trying to get that done as quickly as possible, we have to think very carefully. And uh, I just want to second what Fabio was saying. You know, can we have a modular standard library rather than an everything but the kitchen sink one? That sort of stuff, you know, sometimes you might not need PyWeb, so you shouldn't have to download it and all that sort of stuff. At the moment, we've just been throwing things in, etc. It is three tiny pro. <laughs> <This> is... <laughs> Reality. <laughs> Antonio is part of my three persona thing. He's just <laughs> hidden. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Go ahead, Nicholas. Okay. So, uh, Andre, is this a question for... Um, Fabio or the subject okay go for it then and then the floor is yours for the other two subjects that you've got it's rather about the name PyWeb feels like a lot of responsibility so if we could have it off offline and meaning not not part of the core because it's gonna be over time it's gonna be bigger and bigger and bigger inevitably I think um it's a it's a guesstimate but uh i think that's that, that that's the nature of the web because of the standards change new things and stuff like that so i would be thumbs up to have it as a modular part um i don't have a better name because i i i think like the goal or the um what we want to provide has has to be named like iWeb. It has to be like the, the, the way to simplify JS Python interaction all over the place. So I think the name is cool, but if it keeps growing, I'm not sure it should be in core. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, on that note, we have 10 minutes left. So I'm going to be very strict in enforcing time from now on. Um, so, and Andrea, the floor is yours. Take it away, matey. It's uh, actually, it's, it's going to be hopefully quick, but one is the persistent virtual file system. It's rather an abstract question and not, not, not demo, no nothing. So far I tried to provide um, a persistent file system and on the web. The only way to do that is by index DB, the M script, and compiles the, the, the file system that both PyDad and MicroPython are using to something that can be used through IndexedDB. There are questions and there are issues. So I wonder if anyone actually would like to pursue the, the, the goal of having a shared, shared file system between main thread, workers, MicroPython, I think it's cool. So far, all my all my tests didn't produce anything useful. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but I wonder how much time I should investigate until we have we actually have before we have actually a use case for this. But I think somebody asked 
more than once. How can I persist my data in, in PyScript, PyDive, or Python, whatever? And uh, the answer was always, that's not actually out of the box. And so should we go for it? Should I spend more time? That, that's it. And okay. that's the first topic. Okay. Uh, yeah. my, my initial yeah. feedback and and then perhaps move on to the next subject is clearly persistence is what folks want whether it's on a file system though is something different i having worked with some people where we had a shared a shared home directory uh people are you know different processes or different programs will delete and copy over each other's files and step on each other's toes so if we could have some interesting way of making sure that we ensure a clean separation but fabio go ahead no, no rush. If you need to finish your talk, go ahead. No, no, it's just that. It, I, I agree. A, persistence is important and good for all the reasons you've stated. But B, if we use a file system, uh, we're giving people a shotgun, which, you know, uh, they're going to shoot themselves in the foot many times if, uh, you know, and cause pain. So I, I wonder whether the file system approach is the right way, whether we could think of a different persistence that's Pythonic. I know there are things built into the standard library for persisting data on the file system in a sort of a database. There's a key value store thing that's built into the standard library whose name I forget at the moment. But something like that we could use to persist and they could all access that same thing. But anyway, yeah. Um, so I'll give a different perspective. Um, I think uh, I prefer to give options rather than not give any option, right? And then use that as a exploration effort so that we can make full blown, really simpler and well taught APIs bloom. Um, so in that sense, I, I would I, th I I would support us experimenting and and giving some uh, uh you know some ways so you can store stuff we could use and I think the options you 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 mentioned Andrea are super valid ones um actually in addition we could even also try and map uh, for Chrome experimental etc uh, ways for you to map your underlying file system as well right things like this um so. Plus one, I would start from the simpler and easiest one, and we put it out and, and try. Because um, honestly, in the convo and on the uh, issue that you a discussion that you opened, Andrea, I wasn't. I think more like I didn't have enough time to sit down and really think about the differences and if there's one clear winner from the user point of view, right? Or if it's transparent uh, and feels like it's transparent, they don't even realize but we need to talk more about the details yeah okay um, I, there's five that, hang on, sorry, sorry andrea there's there's literally five minutes left and uh i just want to make sure that we get everything in that we've got in the in the thing so if you want to very quickly yeah. answer and then move on to the next thing that would be appreciated yeah it, it is transparent but it's going to be confusing because the moment we say persistent people expect files that are a lot of storage and that's not going to happen so I I appreciate all your feedback and uh, next topic is about status of bugging. So I'm asking this. I'm gonna quickly share my screen if I manage. And um, so I have, I was digging into a bug today, and the result is that they asked me to introspect uh 21 day of file and i was like okay maybe <laughs> this is not the best way to go but at the end of the day i'm, I'm not complaining about uh, our error stack trace or anything but it's really hard when you have very huge files to understand the error what's going on and the, when, when people file issues and so i'm just wondering if anyone knows because i've heard before that are you that gonna provide somehow a dev tool experience where you can debug into directly into the python code does anyone know the status of this or a no is a is an okay answer it's just uh, sometimes where, where where users are finding issues uh, that that might be super handy, but I, I think we are not there yet. Uh, I think the status is, as with all things PyScript, um, ask Hood. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, but yeah, okay. I, I was hoping for somebody that was updated or knew already about this because we discussed this last year and uh, and I don't know the status. So maybe I will just ask who. Yeah. <laughs> please so report. Sure. Please report back what he says <laughs> as well. Uh, also remember that we hopefully will be able to have some of Damien's time as well in the next few weeks, in which case we can perhaps talk to him about this sort of stuff as well. So we get because uh, MicroPython is famously cryptic because of its very short error messages because space and all of that. Um, you know, if we can perhaps be a bit more uh, vo uh, uh, verbose yeah. in those as well, that helps with uh, with debugging too. Uh, Andrea? Yes, I just have one last concern uh chris mentioned that the micropython code is growing 600 lines of code i don't know but i don't remember the number exactly uh, in this case it was 20k lines of code and i'm a bit worried that micropython should scale not up to 20k maybe but uh, more than 600 lines yeah. so i'm really i'm really interested in to find yeah. the reasons stuff my brain it's not the, the number of lines but it's the uh, complexity of the code as well so if you have a lot of classes that the compiler has to spend more memory in in representing that so it, it's more of the the memory required to, to compile the code that, that there's a fixed limit on that so here's the thing so, so chris those fixed limits that might work really well if you're on a um a Pi board or something, um, we can change for the browser, which uh, the, the browser compared to a Pi board is is like uh, I don't know a yeah, solar system nice. compared to the yeah. to, to a field in a in a farm in terms of space. Um, so yeah. you know we can in terms of MicroPython's machinations, um, it's like almost infinity. Um, so it, it could just go ahead yeah. really. Um, but this is this is a discussion to have with Damien, and he's well aware of these as well when I've spoken to him. In fact, I'm speaking with him on Thursday as well. I'll catch up with him just for a social call, um, virtual call. Yeah, and that is very relevant to the Pi, to all, well, really all the standard library and yeah. that we have. But the the work on elements has shown that limitation as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I'll, I'll mention it to him. I'll mention it to him. Okay, so Fabio, you and I have a call in about, I don't know, 90 seconds. Um, so... <laughs> If there's if there's nothing else, uh, I'm going to just stop the uh, recording.